Freud acknowledges that his audience may have some prior knowledge of psychoanalysis, but assumes they know it's a treatment for neurosis. He then highlights a key difference between psychoanalysis and other medical treatments. Instead of downplaying difficulty and promising success, psychoanalysis emphasizes the challenges and uncertainties involved. The text concludes by hinting that Freud will explain the reasons behind this seemingly counterintuitive approach later in the lecture. Freud discourages the audience from pursuing psychoanalysis. They argue that the audience's existing education and way of thinking makes them natural opponents to the field. Even attending lectures won't make them psychoanalysts. Furthermore, the speaker warns that a career in psychoanalysis would lead to professional rejection and societal hostility. Freud acknowledges the difficulty of learning psychoanalysis, but welcomes those who are still interested. They then compare learning medicine to learning psychoanalysis. In medicine, you can see things directly, like dissections and patients. Psychoanalysis, however, is different. You cannot directly observe the unconscious mind. Freud argues that talking is a powerful tool in psychoanalysis, even though it might seem ineffective to some. Unlike other treatments, psychoanalysis relies on verbal exchange between the patient and analyst. The patient shares their experiences and feelings, while the analyst listens, guides their thinking, and observes their reactions. This may seem strange to those who expect more tangible actions, but words have a strong influence. They can evoke emotions, share knowledge, and persuade others. Just like magic words of the past, well-used words in therapy can have a significant impact. Freud explains why witnessing a psychoanalysis session isn't helpful. Psychoanalysis involves uncovering a patient's deepest thoughts and feelings, which they wouldn't share with anyone but a trusted therapist. Because of this, psychoanalysis can't be directly demonstrated. The only way to learn about it is from the therapist, essentially relying on hearsay. This makes it difficult to form an opinion on psychoanalysis since you depend entirely on the therapist's account. Freud argues that even though a historian wasn't present for historical events, we can believe their accounts based on several factors. Evidence from contemporaries. Historians rely on reports from people who lived during the events, like accounts of Alexander the Great by ancient writers. Physical evidence, coins, statues, or mosaics can support the historical narrative. Multiple confirming sources. If different sources tell a similar story, it strengthens the case. Even if these sources only prove people believed the events happened, it's unlikely the historian is making things up or there's a massive conspiracy. The text concludes that by examining motives of the sources and their agreement, we can be confident about figures like Alexander the Great, but skeptical of more obscure historical or mythical figures. Freud discusses how to learn psychoanalysis. While traditional verification methods are absent, the author proposes self-analysis as a viable approach. By studying one's own personality, individuals can gain a sense of the theory's validity. However, this method has limitations. The text concludes that being analyzed by a professional is a superior method, though limited in applicability. Freud argues that medical professionals are limited in their ability to understand and treat patients because their education focuses on biology and not psychology. This lack of understanding of the mind hinders their ability to treat mental facades and leaves patients open to alternative, non-medical treatments. The author places blame on the medical students themselves for not being open to psychological approaches. Freud argues that current medical education lacks a proper foundation in psychology to understand mental disorders. Psychiatry, while descriptive, doesn't explain the causes or mechanisms behind these disorders. Psychoanalysis aims to fill this gap by providing a psychological understanding of mental illness. It seeks to explain the connection between physical and mental disorders using purely psychological concepts. This approach might seem strange because it avoids established ideas from anatomy, chemistry, or physiology. Freud also acknowledges that psychoanalysis faces resistance 
due to two unpopular ideas. One, it challenges a cherished intellectual belief, unspecified in the passage. Two, it goes against ingrained aesthetic and moral values, also unspecified. Freud argues that these prejudices are powerful and understandable because they stem from past human development and have emotional backing. Freud discusses two unpopular assertions made by psychoanalysis. Mental processes are fundamentally unconscious, rather than equating the psychical with the conscious, as is the common view. Psychoanalysis asserts there are unconscious mental processes, which contradicts the widespread belief that the psychical and conscious are one and the same. This idea was met with skepticism by those who favor sober scientific thought. Sexual impulses, in both the narrow and broader sense, play a very large and previously unappreciated role in causing nervous and mental illnesses. Additionally, these sexual impulses make significant contributions to humanity's highest cultural, artistic, and social achievements. This second assertion was also controversial and challenged prevailing views. Freud suggests these two psychoanalytic ideas, though initially met with resistance, pave the way for a decisive new orientation in the world and in science. The author implies the reader cannot yet fully understand the significance and implications of these psychoanalytic principles, but they represent a significant shift in perspective. Freud discusses the resistance and antipathy that has met psychoanalytic research, particularly its assertions about the role of sexual impulses. The author suggests this resistance stems from the fact that civilization has been created through the suppression and sublimation of instinctual desires, especially sexual ones, for the good of the community. Society is uncomfortable being reminded of this precarious portion of its foundations, the strong sexual impulses that underlie human nature. It prefers to divert attention from this reality and instead views the psychoanalytic findings as aesthetically repulsive and morally reprehensible. Freud argues that these emotional objections are then rationalized into logical and factual arguments to try to discredit the psychoanalytic truths. However, the author claims psychoanalysis has no tendentious aim, but is simply trying to objectively describe these difficult realities about human nature and civilization. Freud suggests that overcoming this societal resistance and misunderstanding is one of the key challenges facing the acceptance of psychoanalysis. But the author believes that once this resistance is overcome, the importance and implications of psychoanalytic research will become clear.